Yeah, hi. All right, everyone. We are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is an actor and has done actually so much more that we want to talk about tonight. A little bit about his history and his interests as well. Of course, you know him from popular projects like Twin Peaks and, of course, the Addams Family movies. We are very excited to welcome actor Carl Streichling to our show. Carl, welcome. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Well, hi there. Yeah. I hope you're doing well, sir. How are you doing in all this epidemic stuff? Uh, epidemic, okay so far, but we 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 have an ongoing fire above us in uh, the Mount Wilson area. Mm. Uh, there are still helicopters going back and forth with uh, helicopter tanks with water. Uh, so it's a bit smoky here, but otherwise okay. Yeah, uh, we've talked yeah. about that on the show before. We have to give all of our thanks and, and saluting to the firefighters out here, especially in California, because it's been, it's bad every year, but it's been really bad this year. Oh boy, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I yeah. want I wanted to start out, Carl, because of course, everybody always talks about uh, your acting projects, and of course, the couple that I mentioned right in the beginning of this call here, but I wanted to start out kind of by talking about uh, your your past and kind of how you got started. Everybody assumes that an actor just got started in acting, but with you, that's not actually true. Uh, talk a little bit about your early years. Am I right in reading that you were actually a composer at a very young age? No, nah, that was just uh, a few piano pieces. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a very good, uh, certainly not at the moment, a uh, good piano player. But uh, whenever my family uh, laughs at my uh, piano playing, I can cl I say I'm the only one in the family who has a uh, is a registered uh, composer. So there. <laughs> well, uh, but no, I I, I started out. Uh, I went to film school in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. and uh, I came to Hollywood because I wanted to be involved with the film industry. And the first few years, I had a, a production company with um, a filmmaker, uh, Rene Dowler, uh, who recently passed away. Mm. And um, we had our own sound stage and a 24-track recording studio. Uh, so that's how it started. And the, the acting was just living in Hollywood, being seven foot tall and walking on the street, that's what happens to you, you know? <laughs> you know, some people might say that your life might be a little difficult because you're so tall, but in reality, it's what got you in the movie. Is, is it true that you were walking down the street and this lady started yelling at you and trying to stop you? She got so excited, she abandoned her car <laughs> and, and she ran up to you because she wanted you for a movie. Is that right? That's right. That was Maybell Collins, who was the... Um, she was the assistant to Michael, Michael, uh, what's his name? Um, well, anyhow, for uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Heart Club's band with the Bee Gees, that movie. Wow. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that was that. Yeah, can you remember what you did in the movie? I was trying to recall. Oh, I was um, the, uh, kind of the... Uh, bodyguard of Mr. Mustard ah. um, and I think uh, my name was The Brute <laughs> and um, yeah it was uh, so that was my first um, acting job if you want to call it that in, um, in Hollywood some people say and that's like the worst movie ever but I think it's a fun film it really is it's uh, when you're a Beatles fan it's not a not a highlight but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it, 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 it was fun to to be there at least and the Bee Gees were just wonderful uh, people and uh, they they uh, rescued me from Mr. Mustard once uh, <laughs> the actor who played Mr. Mustard yeah. right. so yeah I'm uh, eternally grateful <laughs> well, incredible cast. I mean, we had Peter Frampton and George Burns and everybody yeah, in that movie. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Now, knowing yeah. that knowing that you had studied uh, film school and, and all of that kind of stuff, how did you feel about kind of walking into your first acting role? Because some people say, well, it made it easier because I knew what a set was like. Other people say it made it harder because I didn't have input. I was just there as an actor. Uh, no, it's, 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 for me, it's, well, I, I went to uh, the American Film Institute for a year, and there they were very much focused on how you communicate with actors. So I just kind of turned that around when I uh, was being asked to be an actor, and uh, I, I made use of those um, of those lessons. Right. How does uh, the education in film and, and how films are made and, and how the whole business is approached uh, in comparing Hollywood USA to the Netherlands? Well, uh, back then it was uh, actually the, 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 the film school was really well equipped, better than um, I went to UCLA for UCLA for uh, uh, a semester, and uh, they were much better equipped in um, in Amsterdam than at UCLA. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there, there was not much of a film industry there. Uh, but now I'm just amazed what uh, what they churn out in, uh, especially Scandinavia, Scandinavia and Iceland, and so all these. Um, these uh, Scandi Noir TV series, mm -hmm. they're really well done. Right. Yeah. Now, I have to ask you, I mean, obviously, over the years, you've done a little bit of everything. Uh, you've been in a lot of major, major motion pictures. But I have to ask even about the little things that you've done, uh, because we are about a lot of the obscure projects here. How do you compare and contrast doing a, a big, major production to some of the projects you've done, like Bigfoot and Wild Boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the, the the big projects are uh, a lot more comf comfortable, um, and otherwise it doesn't make that much of a difference. Uh, I, I take it just as serious, so right. seriously. Well, you even got to be yeah. in uh, the Ewoks Battle for Endor, right? Yeah, that, that was my first uh, quote-unquote speaking role, uh, <laughs> 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 where I got to speak uh, an Andoric language. Uh, I still remember one sent sentence. <clears throat> uh, it was "Gachar uh, Grachab Nortsharal." <laughs> and it, uh, it meant you really screwed up this time, Cheryl. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't see that. What character did you play? Because certainly you're too big to play an Ewok. <laughs> yeah, no, I was the terrible king. Ah. Uh, king of the marauders <clears throat> who were uh, chasing Ewoks around uh, the island, uh, the planet, I should say. Yeah. 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 Now, in kind of talking about uh, unusual speech patterns that you may have had to have done throughout your career, uh, I have to, of course, bring up Twin Peaks. Um, so, actually, in Twin Peaks, and we'll get more into Twin Peaks in a second, but you had to learn to talk backwards, right? Right. So, and uh, the, the first, uh, so in, uh, in 90 or 93 um, the, the uh, little Mike um, the little person who was part of the, the the Red Lodge yeah Michael Anderson yeah Michael Anderson you could throw any line at him and he could speak it, it was, uh, say it back backwards mm -hmm. Instantly, he didn't even have to think about it mm -hmm. I, I guess it was kind of off the cuff David Lynch said to him well You've got to speak backwards, and he was like, "No problem," <laughs> which was very surprising. Yeah, it's not yeah. something that people usually can do. I mean, it's amazing. How hard was it for for Michael to teach it to you? Um, well, I think he just recorded it, and then we had to kind of uh, copy the recording. Um, 
So I think he didn't have to stand stand there while we were learning it. Mm-hmm. On the the second time around, the second time, oh God, uh, my voice. Um, <clears throat> the second the second time around, um, three years ago, um, there was no Michael Anderson. Yeah. Right. Now we wanted to mention because uh, love your appearance in Twin Peaks so much. I was so glad to find out that you actually came back for the Showtime thing, and and we were talking about how David Lynch had you talk backwards, and uh, I wanted to get more of that uh, into the show talking about Michael. Now Michael, who played the little guy or the man from the other world as they called him, actually taught everybody uh, how to talk backwards because it's something I guess he did naturally. <laughs> it's not something you expect from everybody every day but it's something he did he taught you but then when you came back for the the revival on showtime he wasn't there and what kind of a challenge was it for you to learn to talk backwards without him teaching you well uh, uh it turns out there's a app for that <laughs> <laughs> wow there's an app for everything so uh, uh it uh I, I forget what it's called. I, I used to have it on my iPad, but um, anyhow, uh, it's uh, you you talk, and then it uh, speaks back. It it gives you the uh, it speaks back to you in reverse, mm. and uh, and then I kind of phonetically made a note of that, and uh, and try to learn it that way. <laughs> but what's even more amazing uh, than the fact that, that people like Michael knew how to do that naturally was the fact that somebody actually made an app for doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I wonder how how that kind of app is usually used. I, I, have, <laughs> I, have, I don't think it would work real well at Walmart. I don't, I don't know. Who knows? what it no, is. No, no. <laughs> okay, you know, when you did the, the talking backwards thing, I, I mean... Was it a process? I'm trying to get it in my head. I know you talked about using an app, but did you kind of like listen to it on the app for every line of dialogue you had and just like repeated that back on film right away, or how was that done? Yeah, well, it's it's kind of weird because uh, a lot of words, when you uh, speak them backwards, they, they sound not only backwards, but the, the emphasis uh, is on different... Uh, parts of the word that you mm-hmm. expect it to be, and right. so it's it's really weird. And I I could only uh, get a handle on, on it by also writing it out phonetically, right. and and so looking at it and listening to the to the app and uh, rehearsing it that way. Oh. yeah. I don't suppose there's any dialogue. <laughs> Can you remember any of it? Uh, certainly not backwards, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, the job's done, I'll do it again in 25 years right. when it comes back. Because we get Twin Peaks every 25 yeah, yeah. years. <laughs> the, the thing but was it, it was funny because it, uh, uh, they were so secretive about the script yeah. that um, I got the lines handed over to me, uh, scribbled on a little piece of paper. Mm. Um, and then, well, then it was like, uh, okay, go learn your line and right. uh, come back. <laughs> I think it's incredible that, you know, we got Twin Peaks again. I, I wanted to find out, though, there, there's something that really confused me. And who can better tell me than you, unless by chance you don't know? I don't know, because some actors that are in some vehicles can't always figure out what's going on. I know we talked to the guy from Phantasm, which is Angus Scrim, and he said he had no idea what was going on. But uh, in the original Twin Peaks, you played a character everybody referred to, uh, such as Kyle MacLachlan would refer to you as the giant. And then in the sequel, if you want to call it the sequel, or the revival from Showtime, you were known as the fireman. Now, was there a reason for that? Were you the same character? Were you two different characters? What was the uh, situation with that? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know why he was called the fireman, except for that he makes an an effort to kind of uh, set things straight, right? Right. But, uh, but I, I saw it as the same character. Mm-hmm. 
so that was my own take on it, but it's not as if we were told how that worked. Right. So which did you prefer more? Was your your role in the original or I think like what you did in the Showtime thing was much more expanded. Maybe it was because Michael wasn't there, so you got like a lot of extra scenes and stuff. And, and aesthetically, with the the sets and the background where you were, uh, I think it was better. But which did you prefer doing? Well, in the in the second one, I got to be a god, right? So yeah, right. yeah hey. <laughs> <laughs> Now, let me ask you about uh, your scenes that you did in uh, Twin Peaks The Return with Joy Nash, uh, because they, they were beautifully shot. I know, Carl, that you yourself are into photography, um, so what was it like shooting those scenes? I mean, I'm talking about, the, hopefully everybody's seen it at this point, but the scenes with the orbs, and you're in this ornate, beautiful cedar. Um, did you have any, any input at all? Did did was I mean, what was it like working with uh, David Lynch on those scenes, which were just so aesthetically gorgeous? Yeah, it, it looked beautiful. It it, uh, it was shot in a, a defunct old theater downtown awesome. in downtown Los Angeles, and uh, they had kind of uh, I think just with <laughs> with. Um, with a spray or so, they sprayed its pattern on the on the floor, mm -hmm. and um, nowadays with these video cameras, you hardly need any light anymore. Right. which is pretty amazing. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, we were instructed to look at the screen and um, and to look at the orb and. Um, I just had the sense that something important was happening, but I didn't know what. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Actors pretty much vary on that, that point of not actually seeing what's there because they put that in later. Is that easy for you or hard? Some say it's easier, some say it's harder. Uh, well, in this case, it was easy. It, it gets difficult when, um, when you, like when they do an over shoulder shot. Mm -hmm the camera operator always tells you to look in a certain direction and it's almost never to look at the person you're talking to right and that that is a very weird feeling to <laughs> to to talk to somebody to communicate with somebody and not look at them right um, yeah, yeah. I, I i love the part of the or because like i said i mentioned I'm just like reaching out here. I, I doubt if it's true, but uh, being a, a fan of the movie Phantasm, did anybody say anything to you that the orbs in, in the Twin Peaks, the return was kind of a nod to Phantasm that David Lynch was getting? Because they had the orbs in Phantasm, too. Uh, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if David Lynch ever saw Phantasm, or, but yeah. Uh, yeah, it was an orb. <laughs> right, right. Well, uh, in kind of talking about, I had mentioned that you were into photography. Now, first of all, I want to encourage our listeners to head over to Carl's uh, website, which is at carlstriken.com. But I want you to talk a little bit about the photography you do, because when people say photography, they think, you know, flat landscape, you know, 8x10 or 5x7 or whatever. But your photography is a little bit different that you're into. Can you talk about what spherical panoramas are? Yeah, uh, and by the way, the website for spherical panoramas is uh, sphericalpanoramas.com. Okay. Um, but uh, but there's a link from my other website. So, um, yeah, initially I got interested. Well, in the in the. Uh, late 70s um, I was working on a movie on a super low budget movie uh, with a friend and um, I was kind of in charge of uh, some of the special effects and I kept going to these special effects houses and, and asked them if something was possible right mm -hmm. and um, and what I wanted at that time was 
a, a completely virtual set, right? Uh, and then when I first learned about the spherical panoramas in the in the 90s, during the yeah, in the I think somewhere in the 90s, uh, I thought, oh, this would be perfect for a virtual set because you can uh, point the camera in any direction, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, that's how I got interested in it initially, and then uh, I just found it a very appealing um, way of of shooting photos. So mm -hmm. I kept at it. Was that why you were? I also read that you had uh, been involved with uh, some software engineering. Was was that related to that, or no? That was <coughs> that was um, in the early 90s I, when I first got uh, invited to these uh, fan conventions um, it, it I it, it was kind of a weird when, when you're not used to doing that mm -hmm. it feels re weird to sit behind a, a table and sign autographs <laughs> so <laughs> so I thought well I'll uh I, and at the same time, I was, I was working on this system where you, uh, like a very primitive VR system. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I thought, oh, well, I'll take that with me um, and I'll make a few. <coughs> oh, there it starts again, no. my voice. Uh, and I'm not even in the garage, but right. um, I'll, I'll take it with me and the whole system and then I'll make a few uh, uh, kind of uh, hack kinds of games mm -hmm. right and uh, so it, it was kind of a, a very primitive rendition of what the holodeck would be like could be like right. well it um, seems like you and, and Michael from Twin Peaks had a lot in common because I'd heard that he was interested in a lot of technical stuff too yeah, I think, uh, didn't or doesn't he do uh, CGI stuff? Yes. I'm, I'm not sure about I that. I think so, yeah. Huh? I think so, yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. We, don't, we don't want to, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about uh, you taking up the role in the revival of a classic sitcom that baby boomers grew up adoring. And that was the Adams family, and uh, you yeah. ended up taking on the position of Lurch, the character of Lurch, in the '90s films when they were kind of brought back around. You talked a lot uh, in interviews about the fact that people on the street would think you were Lurch. Obviously, they obviously thought you were Ted Cassidy. From <laughs> <laughs> the the age right. difference should have clued them in. I mean, that was a long time ago. But people always thought that you were Lurch, and isn't that how much experience do you have? With the Adams family, when you got offered the uh, the new movie, and that, at least I say it's new, uh, as far as you know the current incarnation. But uh, yeah. were you like a fan uh, uh, of Ted Cassidy? Did you ever meet him, or? Uh, well, I met him once without knowing that he uh, had been Lurch. Cool. Um, it was totally coincidental. It was on the set of uh, Roar, a, a movie that. Tippy Hedren was involved with, uh -huh. or, or her husband was. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, producing that movie, yeah, with all these lions and uh, lots of accidents. Uh, <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, but I, I had never seen a TV series, but I uh, was familiar with the uh, with the original uh, cartoons in in or, or uh, comics in in. Uh, uh, the New Yorker. Yeah, Charles Adams, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, when you turn around and took the role on, uh, did you like, you know, a lot of actors say, well, I didn't want to copy the original, I want to do my own incarnation. Is that pretty much the way it was with you, or did you take from the original series at all? No, I had never seen the original series, so um, it was it was simple to do something else because yeah. I didn't know. Uh, <laughs> right. 
Well, we actually heard uh, there was some news the other day. Uh, sometimes it's a rumor; it doesn't happen. But uh, it, it made that uh, Tim Burton is uh, shopping around a TV version of the Adams Family of something he's done. It's all live action. Uh, have you heard anything about that, or did they by chance contact you? No, I, I haven't heard anything about that. Um, wow, well, who knows? <laughs> well, it's probably not set in well, stone I mean, yet. Maybe we'll be lucky and we'll, we'll have you back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's got to be a fun well, ride. When, when, I, uh, when we started doing the Adams Family and they were trying out different kinds of uh, makeup and prosthetics on me, I kept saying, I'm, I'm not, I don't look old enough. Make me older, make me older. Yeah. So they don't have to worry about that anymore. No. <laughs> well, you were kind of lucky because, well, I guess the Adams family kind of did that too. But, you know, with, with your height and everything, uh, back in the day, a lot of, it's sad, a lot of the actors didn't get seen because, you know, they were inside heavy makeup and stuff. I know you've done some of that. But like with Lurch, you got to be able to use your facial expressions so we could see your face. Right, and that was a lot harder on uh, uh, on the Evox movie um, um, because the, the latex was really this thick layer and so you could move your face whatever you wanted but it hardly yeah. showed on the on the mask yeah. so well uh, yeah it, it helps not to have to wear that yeah. you guys really accomplished something with the Adams family stuff because the way fans are, they're so diehard, and, and most of us are, are like, oh, God, no, they're not redoing a classic. But it became so popular. I, I mean, that's hard to do because so many things just crash and burn when they try to do a beloved classic. And What do you think it was about you guys' vehicles that, that made it almost as popular as the original series? Well, I, I think that uh, Angelica and Raul and uh, Christopher Lloyd uh, yeah. and Christina, she, th those um, four, they they were really so exceptionally good at uh, yeah. um, just uh, with those four, it was bound to be a, a good movie. Right. Well, we had the uh, actor that played Cousin It from the original Adams Family on the show, and he was laughing because he was talking about how uh, Lisa Loring and, and uh, the two kids on the show, Pugsley and Wynn, Wednesday, were fighting all the time. I've got to ask about Christina Ricci now. She was very young when you did that show, and how did she impress you on the set, and did you have any idea that she would grow up to be as great an actress and, and as popular as she is today? Oh, she she was already a great actress, and she... Uh, a lot of the stuff that she did, she came up w uh, with herself, and um, no, she was very impressive. Mm. Um, so, yeah, no, it wasn't surprising at all that she uh, became what she uh, what she is. Now, uh, another highlight from your career, of course, was uh, when you were involved with Star Trek: The Next Generation. Again, kind of a, a spin-off, if you will, of, of an original that was very beloved. So talk a little bit about your involvement with uh, Star Trek and, and, and getting to work with uh, the amazing cast that you got to work with over there. I mean, you're talking about people like Sir Patrick Stewart. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the, the Star Trek, I was a real fan of. Um, I, uh, in the in the 60s when I was in high school in Holland I uh, I used to come over uh, during the summer because I had relatives in uh, the San Diego area Del Mar Rancho mm -hmm. Santa Fe and so on um, and uh, so I, I was already familiar with the original Star Trek and it was when I when I decided to come and live here um, it was in a rerun so I, um, I I was familiar with it and when they asked me uh, when I got called for a casting call uh, it was for one time part right and 
Uh, and I said, well, uh, could I hold out for a recurring part because I like the show so much? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're smart. Yeah, well, you, you don't need you don't need a manager, do Carl. You don't need a manager, <laughs> Carl. You can handle things on your own. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you were lucky in the fact that once again, I, you're a very brave man because to be stepping into things that's you know already so popular and uh, to do a reboot or whatever, and you were lucky in the fact that that was popular too. What did you think about when they turned around and said, "Okay, there's going to be a sequel to a beloved Stephen King movie." Mm-hmm. Uh, and you wound up doing Doctor Sleep because you're uh, in a movie that's supposedly an extension of the story of The Shining. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I I had done one other movie with uh, 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 Mike Flanagan, and um, and I really liked his style, and and so I I, I had the sense that. Uh, that this was going to be a big movie mm-hmm. and yeah and it was a, I, I, I loved the part that I got so yeah everything was good about it <laughs> yeah yeah we actually saw the film now for those of our listeners who haven't uh, Carl plays Grandpa Flick in uh, Doctor Sleep uh, wh- what was it like uh, shooting on the set and, and the question that everybody always asks I'm assuming no but the question that everybody always asks is, did you get a chance to meet Stephen King or did you guys ever hear any feedback from Stephen King on what he thought about the film Dr. Sleep? Stephen's had mixed emotions about how his movies have come out from his books. A lot of times he doesn't like the way they come out, so I don't know if he liked this or not. But Well, the, 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 the reason that uh, he... Uh, because he, he never allowed uh, the... Uh, it, the, the Doctor Sleep to be made into a movie because he didn't trust uh, anybody to do a good job with it. Right. But because Mike Flanagan had uh, done such an amazing job with uh, another Stephen King sto- uh, mo- a story that had always been considered to be unfilmable. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it was the first when when he got suggested as a director. Uh, it was the first time that Stephen King said yes. They gave the go ahead. Wow. wow, that's incredible. Yeah. It, it kind of threw me because the story was very different. Uh, do you think that that was like a, a good thing to do, or maybe a, a brave? Uh, decision to go off in a different direction. We're used to the, the haunted hotel and everything, and, and you know, uh, Jack Nicholson and everything, spending the night and all that there, and, and working, and the ghosts from the hotel and everything. Then we get into this movie. It's more about psychic vampires or, or energy draining vampires, if you will. What do you think about the fact that it was a totally different story? I mean, of course, Stephen King wrote it that way, but how did that impress you as as to uh, how you thought it would come off to people? Well, I think overall, uh, the way Stephen King, uh, I, I've heard that he described it was that um, the uh, the Shining was about uh, addiction, mm-hmm. and um, Doctor Sleep was about recovery. Yeah, there you and, go. And uh, uh, yeah. The vampires, or the <laughs> are are my little group of people. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, I thought you were incredible yeah. because it, I mean you've acted in a lot of films, but I thought this really showed your true acting ability. I mean, your scenes really bothered me. <laughs> I still can't. Doctor <laughs> Sleep. I still can't sleep, Carl. That from, movie really creeped him out. It, it just there was something just mentally disturbing about that movie. I don't know what it was, but uh, you weren't in the original Shining, but you did get to work with, uh, <coughs> excuse me, you did get to work with Jack Nicholson in The Witches of Eastwick, right? Right, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, uh, you know, the, the bacon number? Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're familiar with that? Yeah. Um, so, uh, how many steps 
uh, how far removed are you from Kevin, Kevin Bacon? Bacon? Yeah, the three degrees of <laughs> Kevin Bacon. <laughs> and I, I have a Bacon number of two. So. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> All right, well... Be thanks, thanks to Jake Nicholson. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, I was wondering, because yeah. a question I love to ask people uh, when they get roles like yours, of course, you know, a lot of it, and it's not a bad thing either, you get a lot of your roles because of your height, okay? Uh, what do you think about that? Do you, does that bother you that, oh, I'm never going to get to be the romantic lead, they're going to cast me as the big <laughs> tall guy? I mean, does that bother you, or what do you think about that? I know you said in an interview that how tall you are which is seven foot i believe that it never really dawns on you how tall you are right yeah no no it it, uh, it took me a while um i was way into my 20s before i kind of because people always reacted kind of strangely to me and um uh, then it, it finally dawned on me, well, yeah, because I'm a bit taller, right? Right. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, where, where did we start out with this question? Uh, well, I was just wondering how you felt about <laughs> oh, getting... Typecast. You get, yeah, you get You get kind of different roles, shall we say. Well, a lot of times they, they cast you even as, as either like a monster or they ta as like a villain... When I had even told Terry when we watched Doctor Sleep, and he was like, "Oh, this is really creepy." I was like, "I talked to Carl in email. He's totally nice. He's a teddy bear. There's nothing to be scared of." <laughs> so, what do you think about the fact that, yeah. that you get different roles because of your height? I mean, you're always going to fit into that type of thing. You'll never be a, a jockey uh, on a horse. <laughs> let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't mind skipping the romantic lead either. Um, it's it's more fun to be a character actor, yeah. I think. I know um, you uh, said in an interview one time that uh, you wasn't real fond of playing the the evil kind of monstrous like guy because you don't think you're uh, imitating or not imitating but uh, intimidating. Well, no, I, I was. Uh, that was in reference to uh, to kind of mafia types, heavies, yeah. you know. Right. And that I cannot do it all. Right. Uh, just stand there and, and intimidate people. No. <laughs> well, it definitely proves your actors. I've met a lot of people that got movie roles because of their size or shape or whatever. Uh, hung out with Angus Grimm for Phantasm, known as the Tall Man. Uh, other people like that. And they go way out of their way to make sure that, that people know that they're the, and they are the nicest guys. I don't know if they do it consciously because they want to make sure people know that they're an actor and they're not really, you know, these bad villains, the, the bad villainer <laughs> type. But but people that are tall or people that are, uh, you know, that get those kind of roles are always the nicest people there is to meet. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. Yeah. So uh, okay. Last couple questions. Uh, next to last question I want to ask you, because I know you do, or at least before lockdown, uh, you do a lot of these fan conventions. Now, we've been to some of them on both sides of the table, and uh, I always like to ask our guests, what is the funniest or craziest thing that you ever had happen or said to you at a fan convention? Because let's be honest, we're all fans, but it can get a little fanatical, a little crazy in some instances. Well, I uh, I once had uh, a young guy walk up to me with blueprints of uh, space ships, <laughs> and uh, I think he was convinced that the thing would fly, and uh, so somehow he thought that I would be able to make it happen uh, by showing it to... Uh, to people at NASA or something. I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah, that was the most outlandish, maybe. Yeah. Now, my <laughs> final question is, is, I've got to know, because we love Twin... We're major Twin Peaks fans. We're sitting here in the radio studio. We have it dressed like the Black Lodge, you know, with the, the <laughs> Chevron rug and everything. So we're one of those crazy uh -huh. people that come up and ask you for your autograph <laughs> that you think should be in therapy or whatever. But, uh, you know... The thing that really freaked us out about the whole Twin Peaks thing is Cheryl Lee, in, in the beginning, the end of the beginning uh, of the first series, had said, I'll see you in 25 years. 
And then I'll be damned, but 25 years later, (laughs) (laughs) Twin Peaks comes back around again. Do you think there is ever a chance? I I know, you know, that David's a little up in age, but he's certainly, you know, still kicking and and feeling good and, and still is in the game. Do you think there could ever be a chance, with or without David Lynch, that there could ever be another return to Twin Peaks? Well, first of all, I don't think it could be done without David Lynch. Yeah, that's I agree. Um, I agree. And uh, this, well, the first time around, uh, he did a few episodes, but a lot of other ones were done by other directors, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, while um, they were good, you could tell because David Lynch was the best at directing that show. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, but. This time around, he did everything, right. and uh, and after that, he had to do the post-production of this gigantic. Uh, I mean, it's basically one movie, right? So mm-hmm. this gigantic movie, and uh, I think that probably I'm guessing that took a lot out of him. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know if he, right. if he wants to do another uh, one like that. Maybe yeah. a feature, maybe another feature. Yeah. yeah. I, I know you did a lot of your scenes with Kyle McLaughlin. You guys get along pretty well off camera. I mean, could I ever run into you guys at Denny's or something sometime <laughs> together? <laughs> uh, well, he, he's he's uh, easy to get along with, so uh, that's that's not no problem. Yeah. Um, I I think nowadays he hangs out a lot in uh, where is it Oregon or so mm-hmm. where he has his wine yeah. uh, his winery yeah so I don't know how how much he is in uh, Los Angeles but yeah, uh, yeah. And, then, and then last question I, I have to ask you about a project that is listed as upcoming uh, it, it and you know sometimes these happen and sometimes they don't but can we look forward to the Eden theory with you and if so what is that about uh, Eden th- oh, you mean that's uh, listed in IMDb? Yeah. Yeah. Th- no, that's uh, that's from a a, a, a young guy in uh, um, uh, somewhere in the Midwest who um, uh, Michigan, Michigan, um, who uh, he sent me a the most elaborately decorated envelope I ever got in my life <laughs> uh, when he was still in high school and I I hung the envelope on my wall and a few years later when he was I guess in college or just out of college he contacted me for this movie that he wanted to do and uh, so I just said yes and I have no idea when it's going to be finished mm-hmm. but uh, yeah <laughs> well you're an interesting guy you're definitely a humble guy I loved what you said about how <clears throat> it's kind of weird for you to sit across the table and sign autographs because <laughs> I love that because you know definitely down to earth guy and I also love your philosophy you said in being in Twin Peaks stuff like that didn't seem unusual for you that you thought it was just you know normal everyday life so you obviously have a great imagination that's why you're such a great actor we thank you so much for being on the show I wanted to find out since tonight is Halloween as we're airing this tonight on Halloween uh, what do you think of Halloween and, and I gotta know like has any kid ever come up to your house trick or treating and said lurch <laughs> well uh, not quite like that but I when my daughter was Little, she's now a doctor, but when she was like seven years old or so, uh, we would always walk to the front door together mm-hmm. when there were kids ringing for um, on Halloween, and I would hold a flashlight under my face, and <laughs> and they would run away screaming. <laughs> so then, then I was forbidden to uh, walk to the door with her from that moment on. <laughs> You're, you're not scary, Carl. You're a pussycat. You really are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Carl, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us. It's been great having you on the show, and we look forward to many future projects from you, and hopefully the whole industry can get back to work in some kind of normalcy soon. 
Yeah, yeah, would have that. That'd be nice. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you ever done, uh, do you do the, the Twin Orleans. Peaks uh, yeah. Day thing that they have, uh, like Twin Peaks Day? Uh, Twin Peaks Day. Thing? Like what the festival, the Twin Peaks. The, festival. the festival where they all get together. The last time it was at uh, Graceland in in Memphis at Elvis's Mansion. They all get together, have like a convention thing. Do you ever do those? No, I, I've done a few uh, Twin Peaks conventions, but they were in um, in, in Washington State, in, oh, okay, uh, yeah, around Seattle. Yeah, and exactly. They, they they are the best conventions. Uh, uh, usually, a rather small group, and but you you have picnics on all the different uh, areas where they shot the movie yeah. uh, or shot the, the series. And it's really nice. Uh, so I, I always lo love being invited for those things. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right. Well, and by the way, just a, a note. They tried to move it to Graceland in this year, but then it got canceled because of COVID. Oh, okay. So <laughs> maybe they'll learn their lesson and put it back where it belongs next time. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. right. Well, thank you again. <laughs> thank you again, Carl, so much. And uh, we look forward to your future projects. And uh, have a great rest of the weekend and a happy Halloween. And happy Halloween to you. Yeah. All, All right. right. Thank okay. you, Carl. Bye All right, bye-bye.